whatever you did, if it wasn't good enough, you needed to try and do better and keep at it. Actually, village life produces the philosophical ideas that are germane to democratic thought and practice. I mean, just losing four of your bandmates, soulmates is bad enough. But the worst thing is out of those four families, two of the families blamed me. But the progress from 1991 to 2017, I think only took India to a better place. It was really through the, uh, th through the transition into politics that I, uh, that I had the good luck of becoming a writer. I would call the Jaipur Literature Festival a living library or perhaps even a library of life. Do join us as we share the excitement of ideas and of debate and dialogue, of the adventures of science, of the joys of poetry and music, the consolations of philosophy, the sense of literature and of life. so much about the festival in India, um, the scale of it, the energy of it, and I just love the fact that there is this effort to bring it to um, other cities in the world. It's a variety of topics, it's meaningful. I'm just excited, I'm, I'm feeling uh, like I've learned a lot, a lot to think about, and I uh, appreciate JLF co coming here. Going forward, it would be a, a very good thing to do for the community, to have this event on an annual basis. I think that when you hear so many different voices and perspectives about the South Asian diaspora and many other issues, you learn that there's a lot of history that you're not taught every day, um, and I think that that's important to bring in today's world. I was actually really surprised by the camaraderie I experienced here and the way that people at JLF, both attendees and other panelists, seem to really connect profoundly to literature and care about it. Nothing's going to stop us from bringing our writers and speakers to you in Boulder, Colorado, Houston, 
New York and Toronto, Canada. We are delighted to welcome you to the ninth edition of the JLF at London at the British Library supported by Haldi Rams. It's our pleasure to present to you today East Minister, West Minister, Constitutions and their fault lines. Despite shared constitutional heritage and political forms, India's East Minister de democracy has diverged widely from West Minister over the last 75 years. However, recent events such as Brexit, the COVID-19 pandemic, and questions of free speech, dissent, and civil liberties in both India and the UK have revealed a different picture. Baroness Helena Kennedy is a member of the House of Lords Justice and Home Affairs Committee, an expert in human rights law, civil liberties, and constitutional issues, and the author of Miss Justice, How British Law is Failing Women. Tripur Daman Singh is an academic and the author of Nehru, The Debates That Defined India and 16 Stormy Days, the story of the First Amendment of the Constitution of India. In conversation with Chintan Chandrachut, barrister, and the acclaimed author of The Cases That India Forgot and Balanced Constitutionalism, Courts and Legislatures in India and the United Kingdom, Baris, Baroness Kennedy and Singh discussed the similar faults and challenges both East Minister and West Minister are struggling to address. This conversation will be followed by a Q&A session. Do follow our social media handles, get notifications on the upcoming sessions. Please tweet and tag using at JLF Litfest and use the hashtags, hashtag JLF London 2022 and JLF London at British Library. Ladies and gentlemen, East Minister, West Minister, Constitutions and their fault lines, Tripur Daman Singh and Helena Kennedy in conversation with Chintan Chandrachur. Thank you for that um, introduction. You've saved me the trouble of introducing my um, esteemed co-panelists. So let me jump straight in uh, to you, Tripur Daman. Uh, the title for today's discussion was inspired by a piece uh, uh, in the Times of India that you wrote a few months ago. And you said in that piece, and I quote, that the creation of the Constitution was far more than just the transplanting of the Westminster system on Indian soil, and that India's founding fathers wanted to shape their own version of Westminster, and hence, of course, Eastminster. Uh, I'm sure we can come up with many other variations, for example, Westminster with Indian masala, or the reverse of chicken tikka masala, or the, or the like, but we'll save that for later. Uh, but can you elaborate on that and identify some of the key differences uh, between Westminster and Eastminster? Because conventional wisdom is that there is a certain colonial continuity, mm -hmm. and that institutions that existed in India uh, prior to independence uh, carried on as they were. Uh, based on their inherited traditions. Uh, right, so before I start, just a quick shout out to my friend Harshan Kumar Singham, who actually coined the term Eastminster, uh, which I rather shamelessly um, used. Mm. But it's true that while the Indian constitution was grounded in the Westminster tradition, uh, they, there were very specific uh, problems that they were also trying to address. And one of them was, of course, the lack of uh, any previous experience of democratic rule, uh, and uh, one was the lack of these sort of background conditions that we normally take for granted, that is a certain level of uh, socioeconomic development, education, so on and so forth. Uh, and so the Indian constitution, in trying to address those, diverges uh, in ways that initially can seem quite innocuous, uh, but are actually very, very substantial, which make it a typology of its own. And I think the examples that I gave in that piece are, uh, uh, say, something like the um, power of ordinance that is provided to the Indian president, uh, which grants the legislature, uh, sorry, which grants the executive the power to legislate in place of the legislature uh, without a declaration of emergency or anything. 
uh, or um, laws that place, uh, for example, the executive in the kind of driving seat of legislative business, that is, um, the power to prorogue parliament, um, for example, uh, where, uh, I mean, the Indian constitution, for example, only the only limit it sets is that there can't be more than six months between two parliamentary sessions. Uh, but it literally leaves it up to the executive to, for example, decide when those sessions are. So those are just two examples, but I mean, we can, uh, we can run through more um, if you'd like, but in and of itself, what they do is that they uh, place a lot of emphasis on executive supremacy and uh, they kind of diminish the legislature quite a bit. Um, and that's, I think, the most sort of, uh, that's the primary or what I would say the most obvious uh, way than it w uh, in which it diverges. And, and was that a conscious choice uh, made at the time of the founding? I.e., did the founders consider the Westminster system uh, as it is and reject it on the basis that it is unsuitable for Indian conditions? Or did it happen more glacially or in, a, in an unconscious way? Uh, I mean, it is possible to say that they weren't quite entirely cognizant of what uh, what the repercussions of what they were doing could be. But they were very conscious of the fact that they w it was not just a simple, uh, you know, we pick up what we see in Westminster and we transplant it uh, to India. And even though there, are, um, uh, there were people who were really, you know, not very happy with what was being done, there's, for example, the former chief minister of Karnatak, uh, um, K. Hanuman Thayyam had made, a, m made quite a... Uh, uh, he, he gave a quote, and I, if I remember it correctly, it's something along the lines of we were expecting the, uh, the veena and the tabla, but actually this is the music of an English band. Uh, and in response to that, I would say that it's actually not the, uh, uh, you know, not the music of an English band. And these things are what indigenize uh, Westminster, make it, uh, were thought to make it somehow suitable to Indian conditions grounded in the Indian experience. Helena, do you uh, prefer an English band to the Veena or the Tabla? Well, I was, it's so interesting listening um, because I think your first sentences um, probably explained why um, in creating the Indian constitution, um, your founding fathers decided to give so much power to the executive um, because of, as you said, um, the, the differentials in relation to, for example, education, that the, a large uh, a population were still um, uh, aspiring to education, but hadn't, were still illiterate and there was not the, if you like, democratic literacy um, they felt that was necessary in order to have um, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, distributed power. But, but let me just say to you that um, the whole purpose of, for us in a parliamentary democracy of having the, the parliament as the uh, ultimately um, the seat of power was to make sure that you had some way of constraining the power of the executive, of the, of, of the cabinet, of, the, of those who were in, in governing. And we're experiencing at this very moment in time, and I know that we'll move on to it, but we're experiencing a sort of um, desire to be more like India. Um, we're actually um, seeing an erosion of our um, parliamentary democracy because of the grab for power by our own executive. And so they obviously would much prefer to uh, have an Indian system, um, but we're not going to let them do that. No, of course, and I think it was quite graphically illustrated when um, Boris Johnson did try to prorogue Parliament, uh, and it didn't. Uh, things didn't pan out the way he was uh, he expected. But in, for example, if the context was India, it was perfectly possible for them to prorogue Parliament for a period of six months. Uh, he, must have, he must have been looking over the shoulder of probably. Indian politicians <laughs> and thinking, well, they can do it. Why can't I do it, you know? Uh, I probably, mean, if, yeah. we, if we want a more topical example, we have one from last week, which is the no confidence vote um, against Boris Johnson. And it's arguably an example the other way, because um, Tripur Daman, as I, as I understand it, you don't necessarily contend that the shift to Eastminster is always a good thing. Uh, you say that there are structural weaknesses uh, on account of some of the divergences between Eastminster and Westminster. And one striking example of that is, of course, the lack of internal party, intra-party democracy in India. Uh, and I suppose the, the equivalent of what we saw in the UK over the last two weeks in India is a large number of MPs voting against their own prime minister in parliament, mm -hmm. which I think to any 
any Indian is unimaginable. Um, I, I, I think that, that, that issue, I, I'd like to know more about yeah. it from both of you. That you're saying that internal party democracy is not very well developed in India. Um, that idea that somehow the majority of parliamentarians it could actually unseat someone whom they felt was leading them in a way that had become unpalatable. And while um, uh, it didn't work this time. We have a very wounded uh, prime minister now here in the United Kingdom. And that can affect, of course, um, the way in which government business is done because those who are wounded tend to try very hard to recuperate and, uh, and in doing so may reach for policies which are perhaps ill thought out. Though it's hard to imagine policies being more ill thought out than they have been up until now by this government. Um, do you, have any, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, you're right that in, uh, internal uh, democracy, if one might call it that, uh, in, in parties in India is not very well developed. But that's, of course, one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is that uh, the constitution itself, unlike here, um, intervenes uh, in intra-party politics in India and solidifies power um, for party bosses. Mm -hmm because by, uh, I think you must be familiar with, uh, you know, of course, with it, with the 10th schedule and the, you know, 52nd Amendment and uh, all of these things, which um, enjoin on an MP to resign or, or grant the speaker quasi-judicial power to, uh, uh, to suspend or expel an MP uh, if they vote against the party, uh, you know, what they're told by the party whip. So, um, in a sense, it, the concept of backbench rebellions in and of itself doesn't really exist mm -hmm. in India and hasn't really existed at least since the, uh, you know, since the 80s, yeah. uh, since this um, came a thing. And that's, uh, if I might say so, as, uh, something even more retrograde than not, uh, you know, questions of what party MPs do within, uh, you know, in and of themselves of how they choose a party leader or not. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's interesting. Uh, um, I just, Chin -chin, I do, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting, but I think that there are people in this audience mm -hmm. who are, are not familiar with the Indian system. And, and for example, that comes as, a, as, a, as a, a novel idea to me, that you can't, as a backbencher, ever vote against your own party without there being the consequence that you might end up being dismissed. You can be sacked. Is that right? As a member of parliament, for, yes. if you vote against? Yes. Golly. Um, um, well, that's a bit alarming. Uh, you have to make some. You have to get that changed. Um, um, I certainly wouldn't be well, here. Well, not give Boris Johnson any ideas. I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be here here if I hadn't had the opportunity of voting against my own party, which. You know, I've always said that um, my master is law. I'm a lawyer, I'm, I'm a, a, you know, steeped in the law, and I believe in respecting law and human rights. And, and therefore, whichever government, whether it was a, a government of the party that, to which I uh, generally give my support, um, or the opposition, I will oppose things that I think are running in the face of the rule of law. And, uh, and so that, that it wouldn't be possible, um, for example, if, if uh, Chinton were a politician and he is also a lawyer and a great constitutional lawyer, um, if he, he found something was unacceptable, he wouldn't be able to uh, vote against it? Well, he'd be able to vote against it, but... Uh, he'd pay he a would price. Be, either you, yeah, he'd pay a, he price. pay a price. It would be fatal. Okay. And, and dare I say the seat would be the smallest price I'd pay, so... <laughs> Probably, yeah, um, in, other, in other ways too. Can I ask this about this business of proroguing? It sounds as though the, 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 the executive, you know, that's those who are the ministers and the prime minister. One, I, I'm, I'm pointing this out because one of my sisters once said to me, who, is the, who are the executive? It had puzzled her. Um, and, uh, and not everybody knows that inside language which people who understand uh, uh, the, the nature of governance often use you know, don't understand the inner language. But the executive being ministers, the cabinet, and the prime minister. And, uh, and so uh, you're saying that they have ultimate power in India, and, and it can't be challenged by parliament. Whereas what we're seeing in Britain just now, and there's a big complaint about it, is that we're seeing a sort of shift of power away from parliament, 
which has always been able to hold the executive to account. And we see that as being fundamental, that you can elect a government, they're in there for a number of years, and you don't want to be having elections every other week. So you want them to be in there for a, number, a period of time. But they have to be held to account because um, power is delightful, and absolute power is absolutely delightful. <laughs> and, uh, and so you have to be able to constrain that power. So how is that, how, how are abuses of power by the executive constrained in India? Um, I mean, I'd argue that they're not constrained in any fundamental way. So the Constitution in itself, uh, and unlike, you know, uh, uh, everywhere else, there's no real reason for the executive in India to try any more uh, extra constitutional maneuvers because the Constitution in itself now concentrates power uh, so heavily in their hands. Uh, and as I mentioned right at the start, for example, India is the only country where uh, the executive, uh, where the constitution grants the executive uh, powers to legislate in place of the legislature uh, without there being a declaration of emergency or, or, uh, or you know, some, uh, something like that. And it is uh, possibly the only democracy in the world to have such a, uh, to, uh, to have such a setup. Not even in America where you have quite, a, you know, a powerful uh, presidency is, uh, does the president have the power to legislate in place of Congress? Uh, and this is a kind of legal invention that I'm yet to see anywhere else. So um, I, I do think that this, the fundamental question of how parliament constrains uh, executive power in India is, uh, uh, is something that actually needs some sort of resolution for um, Indian democracy to really uh, thrive or to survive in, um, in the way that we imagine it should. I'd, I'd agree with that, Tripul Daman. And Helena, my, my own view is to put it in a sentence. Um, in India, the executive controls parliament rather than parliament controlling the executive. And it's arguably gotten worse and worse over the years. It's an area of uh, increasing divergence between Westminster and Eastminster. Uh, but if, if I can take a step back, uh, you've been a member of the House of Lords since 1997. Yes. So over 20 years. Um, Parliament has changed, the nature of Parliament uh, and the nature of executive accountability has changed considerably uh, since your time in the, in the House. Uh, are there areas in which you think Westminster can learn from Eastminster? I certainly wouldn't like to see um, uh, the government um, having more power. I, I really do feel that democracy um, is, depends on uh, constraints upon power. And those constraints are exercised in a number of different ways. And in a parliamentary democracy, it's usually that, um, you know, you have to struggle to get your legislation through and your parliamentarians, uh, you know, in taking their oath are making a commitment to basically hold government to account. Now, obviously, those who have ministerial jobs um, want to keep their ministerial jobs, so they're not going to vote against uh, uh, anything that the, the Prime Minister decides he wants to do. And, uh, and, and those who have ambitions to become ministers are usually fairly compliant. So it's usually, um, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's by and large, people can get their, their, their legislation through um, as long as um, they can make good arguments for it. Now, recently, we've seen a departure from good practice. We've seen um, it, the, the, the Johnson government has been um, using what we would call Henry VIII powers. Um, and Henry VIII powers, why would anybody know what Henry VIII powers are? Um, but they're the sort of thing that constitutional lawyers and the judges in the House of Lords are particularly preoccupied by because it means that you are, through secondary legislation, um, giving a lot of power to the government um, uh, you know, to use secondary legislation, which is not scrutinized in the same way as primary legislation. And so we've seen a huge increase in the use of secondary legislation. We've also seen um, um, what happens when you have a huge majority. Um, and uh, many years ago, in fact, during um, uh, the, 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 government, the government of Mrs. Thatcher, um, Lord Hailsham, formerly known as Quentin Hogg, um, uh, once made a, a, a very interesting speech of important constitutional significance where he said, um, that it is not good for parliamentary democracy um, when you have too large a majority, you end up with an elected dictatorship. And that business of having an elected dictatorship is something that should concern all of us. 
um, that huge majority that um, was, was gleaned because of persuading people that, you know, we're going to deliver Brexit, and people had been persuaded that Brexit was a good idea. I was never one of those people. Um, but, um, but, but in making that promise, then many people who would not normally have voted Conservative did, in fact, uh, vote for um, the Conservative government. Mm -hmm. So it's got a huge majority, and it means that even although we in the House of Lords frequently seek to amend legislation, seek to improve upon it, are worried about the, the, the seizing of more too much power to, minister, to the Secretary of State um, in different departments, when, when it goes back down to the Commons, it's overturned because there's such a huge majority. And I just wanted to finally say that one of the real problems that we've got just now is that we get what's called skeleton bills. And that means that we get bills that are put together in the most um, uh, um, perfunctory way. They're not well drafted. Um, and they basically have a sort of idea of something that people want to do. The detail is not present. And what is inside the bill are clauses which then empower the Secretary of State to put flesh on the bones of the piece of legislation. That gives huge power to um, uh, Secretaries of State. And we've seen it in the Home Office, um, um, where um, uh, um, the Secretary of State has acquired a whole lot of powers through that means. And we've seen it in other, in other departments of state. And so that's a very worrying development. And in fact, just, just a couple of weeks ago, our, our former Chief Justice, Igor Judge, a, a, a great legal uh, champion, I think that I remember, uh, Chinton, you um, having him speak at um, uh, one of the debates about Magna Carta. Yeah. Um, and you chaired that. And he was a great, a, he's a, he, you know, he really understands the unwritten British constitution. And he is outraged by what he sees as being a sort of a, a capturing of more power to the executive. And yet the government um, is, is talking about um, rebalancing power as between the legislature and the judiciary, wanting to inhibit the judiciary's powers. And of course, the reason for that is because the judiciary stopped his efforts to prorogue parliament. And uh, it, was, it was our su Supreme Court that put a halt to that. Tipudaman, can I ask you the same question in reverse? Uh, are there particular areas where Eastminster can learn from Westminster? Or are there low hanging fruit? I mean, we've discussed some of the key areas, but those seem difficult. Those seem like they're hard to achieve. Uh, are there easier targets? Um, I don't think any of the targets are actually that easy, given uh, just how much um, Westminster relies on unwritten conventions uh, and uh, precedent and uh, you know these sort of normative, uh, um, I mean, norms that really are taken for, uh, for granted in a, in a way. And uh, that was one of the reasons that Eastminster, in a way, evolved in the way that it did, was that with the lack of any sort of democratic traditions, uh, uh, was the need for um, what one might call you know, instant, instant conventions. Uh, and so one of the, uh, so for Indian politicians operating in that era, uh, 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 the problem was that every administrative difficulty they came up with uh, at one level required a solution, but at another level, uh, whatever they did was also some, uh, was something that was going to create a precedent uh, by virtue of being the first time that it was being done. And I think uh, what, uh, what Eastminster might take from Westminster is uh, a kind of healthy appreciation for just um, how much value there is on uh, uh, on these sort of unwritten conventions and uh, and precedents? Uh, oh, I'm going to disillusion you, because because those unwritten um, uh, conventions are absolutely withering on the vine, mm. because what those unwritten conventions rely upon is honourable behaviour. It it relies upon people behaving well and being honest as politicians. And I'm afraid that we've seen a great reduction in that. Um, one of the, the things that those conventions relied upon was being an honorable, an honorable person. And, uh, and the person who uh, writes a lot about this 
um, is um, uh, uh, Lord Hennessy, Peter Hennessy, one of Britain's great historians. And he talks about the good chaps way of doing politics, right? Well, we're running out of good chaps. And, uh, and so um, the problem is that um, we've seen um, that people can now don't feel ashamed. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't shame, shame Boris Johnson. And so, um, so being um, uh, um, cavalier with the truth, um, uh, being untrustworthy on many different fronts, it, it, it almost doesn't have an impact if you're charming enough and if you somehow are a cheeky chappy. So you're not an honest chappy, but a cheeky chappy seems to get, uh, get a lot of indulgence here in the United Kingdom. And, and I do think that we can't um, escape from the fact that there are two other things that you have to talk about here. And one is the fact of social media, the way in which mm. technology has changed our politics around the world. Political systems are being hugely impacted by social media and, uh, and the whole Twitter sphere and all of that. And that has damaged, I think, um, uh, the, the, the quality of debate, public discourse, the public square has been affected by the disinhibition that that has given, that people feel uninhibited about what they say and the vulgarity of debate and, and so on is now, is now a serious problem. The other problem about, about it is that um, we've, got, we've had two pandemics. There's the pandemic of, that we've all um, daily had to deal with, uh, with COVID-19, but we've, uh, we've also had a pandemic globally of the rise of populist governments. And, those, and, the, the, and it's important for us to understand what that is about and, uh, and that I think is a response to globalism and a particular economic model that has not been successful in, uh, in creating the better society. Um, you referred to both pandemics. I do want to come back to the COVID-19 pandemic, but let's discuss the second pandemic first, if, if you're okay with that. Uh, I'd like some water. Would you, can you pass me a paper cup? That's lovely. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you. So let's consider the Brexit referendum, for instance. Uh, the obviously tempting thought is that if Britain had something of a written constitution, or even if not a full constitution, a canonical document, that that would have been legislated for in a more um, serious way. Was the way in which the referendum was conducted, i.e. you make an, uh, a decision that affects generations by a single vote, by simple majority at a single point of time, uh, appropriate? And if it wasn't appropriate, would having had a written document in advance made any difference or not really? I, no, I, I'm going to make a confession to everybody that I was the chair of Charter 88 throughout the 90s. Charter 88 was a constitutional reform organization. And um, what we sought to do and is, what, is what brought me into the House of Lords really. Um, what um, it, we sought to do, and it was cross-party, and the idea was that we needed to have a much more modern architecture um, for the running of Britain. And one of the things we were advocating for was a written constitution. Um, we also wanted to have a Bill of Rights. We wanted to have devolution decision-making um, in, the, in the sort of nations of the United Kingdom closer to home. Um, we wanted to see a Freedom of Information Act, and we wanted to see reform of the House of Lords so that it wasn't just um, uh, based on hered the hereditary principle. So a lot of that, we had to spend a lot of time persuading um, uh, uh, the Labour government was looking as though it might win the next election in the 90s, and so we persuaded Labour to embrace it. It was hard work, let me tell you, because there's a resistance to lots of those things in quarters of the Labour Party too. Um, and, uh, and, but it became a big part of New Labour's policy to, to have a new sort of, um, a, you know, a, a basically a, a new uh, um, way of people relating to government. And, uh, um, but the one thing that didn't come through was a written constitution. I mean, there was a little bit of softening up of many of those things. They didn't quite happen in the way that we had wanted. But the written constitution wasn't embarked upon at all. And the reason why was no government will give up the legislative time that's necessary to create the, 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 the you know, it would take you, it would take up, I can't begin to tell you how much time, because every sentence would be challenged and, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and be a, a source of, of contest. 
And so um, no government ever wants to do it. So what I want to see now is that I want to see us doing it piecemeal. And the first thing is, is I want to see a return to honest politics. I want people to be forced to resign when they lie to parliament. I want to see that when people behave dishonorably, that they are expected to resign. When there is an inquiry by a senior distinguished civil servant finding out that a senior politician has been bullying staff and civil servants and so on, that person should be required to resign. And so, I mean, the, the standards in politics have to be reasserted, and I want to see that as being the first step in piecemeal creating what ultimately might be a more effective constitutional arrangement. How about that? Tripur Daman, we have a bit of a paradox in India, isn't it? Because we do have a uh, written constitution, a lengthy written constitution. Uh, but it's not one of those constitutions that's, that's hard to amend. It is, in fact, relatively easy, easy to, to amend, amend, particularly if you compare it, for example, to the, to the US Constitution. Simple majority on most occasions typically don't require state ratifications state except for a few issues. And as you know, the Constitution is amended very frequently, often more than once a year. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, I'd like to, how is that done? Is it, is, it, is it set down that if you get two thirds of a majority, you can change the constitution? Uh, that's right. So it's by a two thirds majority present in voting in both houses of parliament. Uh, but there's no referendum. There's no need for state ratification for most amendments, uh, barring a few. And as I've said, I think there have been probably about 120 or so amendments in the last 75 years. So it's... Our problem on, on the referendum issue yeah. was that um, uh, it had never been set down anywhere at the idea that there should be a, a, a two-thirds majority, which would have been very sensible. And, uh, and the problem with the referendum on, on Brexit was that it followed fairly quickly on the referendum in Scotland on independence. And so um, it, it, would, it, would, you know, it, would have been, it should have been done before the Scottish referendum um, because uh, um, once they hadn't done it on the Scottish referendum, it became very difficult to argue that somehow the, 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 the game had to change with one that followed only a short time later. But it's, it's a bit of an unfair game, isn't it? Because you can keep asking for referendums, but once you exit, you can't re-enter. It's very hard to react. Well, I mean, the so long-term impact. It's a lopsided game. Well, I mean, it's, it's rather like the Scottish situation. It was that once you're independent, it's, a, it's, it's got long-term consequences. And uh, I think that any of those big constitutional issues where you have a referendum should require um, something like two-thirds of a majority. Um, I mean, we, do, we you know, the, the House of Lords doesn't have, is not elected, so therefore we don't feel that we have um, the sort of right to, to, to uh, sort of stop something. But um, the, the, certainly I think that um, in, in the Commons and, and in the referendum, there should be some way in which, um, there should be ways in which these things can be done in a much more sensible way. And the fact that, we, that on such a small majority, we've ended up leaving the European Union with the incredible consequences that that will carry for us um, in years to come, and in the balance of powers globally, I think is, is a serious, was a serious issue, and we didn't give enough thought to it in advance. Tripur Daman, have we in India struck the right balance then? Is it enough to say, well, if you have a two-thirds majority in both houses, i.e., uh, if you control parliament, then you can amend the constitution however, however you like, subject to uh, the constraints of the courts, of course, uh, without referenda, without on most occasions state ratification and so on? I mean, I, I, the idea was that with that you wouldn't, because as you said, we have the most lengthy constitution in the world, and one of the ideas behind such lengthy codification was that codification in a way would somehow compensate for the lack of uh, democratic tradition uh, uh, um, or um, historical experience. And that's already, I would say, quite a debatable point of view um, to say that uh, uh, somehow by lengthy codification you will actually teach people uh, how to um, how to really work a democratic system, so I would take exception to that view right you know right from the beginning. Um, and second is that uh, the uh, the problem with amendments is that we've traditionally looked towards the judiciary to kind of uh, really define what can or can't be amended, and the judiciary has never had a particularly consistent position 
Um, and so jurisprudence on this has also evolved. It, it, they've sort of flip-flopped from saying everything is amendable to saying, well, uh, fundamental rights are completely unamendable to then saying, well, fundamental rights are amendable, but you know, we have something uh, called a basic structure, which nobody sort of initially knew, but which over time, I guess, has become clearer and clearer. And so the problem is that uh, we have a quite easy sort of process of, uh, uh, of uh, amendment. Uh, and that process, as we saw both with the First Amendment and recently with the uh, um, amendments to Article 370, uh, is in itself open to, uh, to, uh, to quite be being relatively creatively interpreted. Um, and so uh, I think it, India would do a lot better with uh, somehow amendments being um, either a requirement for two-thirds majority in the, in the provinces uh, or at least to being, uh, I, I'd say, um, uh, especially the provinces where, uh, which are especially concerned with, um, with, the, with, the, with parts of the constitution that's being amended because right now you also have, uh, the union is you know, really given the power, for example, to make or break provinces at, at will. Uh, and I don't think that's a, partic a particularly healthy precedent or a particularly healthy thing for Indian democracy. Would you, would you legislate in a referendum? Would you have liked, for example, for there to have been a referendum uh, prior to the amendments to Article 370? Uh, I would, again, having, uh, you know, if you'd asked me this question before uh, the Brexit referendum, I probably would have had a different answer. <laughs> But uh, having seen how referendums can also unfold, and that's not to say that it's because the result is unexpected, uh, but I think uh, one has to be quite careful before throwing what could be so quite complex questions uh, just open to, uh, you know, open, open, I, I, open to the I public. Really, I, really, I would really advocate that India steers well away from um, referendums. Um, um, I have now got a very jaundiced view of referendums, and I think that um, the change in the way in which information is spread amongst our, our populations um, because of social media makes it very hard to have um, uh, confidence that a referendum is going to work. You ask us a very simple question. I mean, this is the difficult thing about it, is you're asking us a very simple question, stay in or come out of Europe. And, uh, and what we do know, and the, the evidence really is clear, that the Cambridge Analytica um, uh, exposure of how um, uh, the, the you can, through algorithmic interference and so on, actually um, target parts of the population and really um, try to get them not to vote or try to get them to vote in ways that um, uh, might be contrary to their own interests. Um, is, is a really damaging thing. And we've seen it in the United States, just how um, uh, you know, uh, this, this has played out in dividing uh, that nation um, so successfully. And, uh, and I'm afraid that I feel um, alarmed about that interference in elections everywhere now. Uh, before we move to the audience, I do want to come to briefly the second pandemic which you were referring to, the more conventional uh, pandemic, which is COVID-19. And there has arguably been um, executive overreach and underreach in, in both jurisdictions. Um, in India, you might say that, well, um, there was, of course, a lockdown imposed with no notice. Yeah. Uh, and we knew what follows, uh, the exodus of migrant laborers from cities to villages and so on. And arguably also underreach because there was a failure to ramp up uh, public health infrastructure when it could have been ramped up, when there was an opportunity. Um, and it's very much the same in the UK, isn't it? We started with the policy of herd immunity, let everyone go out uh, with, with, with gear abandon. And uh, we then moved to a policy of strict national lockdowns with little or no parliamentary um, oversight. Mm -hmm. uh, what lessons do we learn uh, from those experiences? Well, I, I, I now run um, the International Bar Association's Institute of Human Rights, and so we were monitoring, we had a, a, a specific project of monitoring the impact of COVID and what it did in relation to law um, the world over. And there was no doubt that in many of the governments that I would consider to be populist governments, where they um, rely on simple messages and where um, uh, they, there is usually a very powerful figurehead um, who sort of dictates the terms of debate, um, I, um, 
I, I think there have been serious assaults. I mean, you, it's much better to actually read the, these two pandemics together because what the COVID pandemic um, uh, produced for us were abuses of the rule of law, which they claimed were necessary because of, the, of COVID. And so you saw that, you know, you saw that in so many places. Um, and, uh, and it took different forms, and sometimes it would be sort of, you know, uh, um, cutting off the internet to certain communities so that they weren't even getting information about the, which was necessary about COVID, um, but also forcing people to stay indoors um, in circumstances where that, that provided opportunities for domestic violence, for abuse of children and all manner of things. And so there were, there were serious ways in which COVID provided a sort of cover for um, uh, authoritarian governments to be uh, abusive of the rule of law. Now, I'm a rule of law person. I believe that the rule of law is fundamental to making a democracy work. And what has happened with the rise of populist governments is that popu they, they're usually run by people who don't like don't like opponents. They don't like criticism. They don't. So, so what do they do? They go after their critics. They, 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 they. If you're, if you're Putin, you poison your opposition. If you are um, somebody in other places, you basically um, uh, go after them in other ways. And one of the ways that you can do that is by controlling your media. So often you find in authoritarian, you know, authoritarian democracies, the, the, uh, sort of, the idea of liberal democracy isn't about, it's not about being liberal in terms of uh, even of progressive uh, ideas. It's about being government for everybody. And that, that means everybody, including minorities. And what you see in places like uh, Hungary is, a, is, a, is a, 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 a democratically elected leader who, who would say that he is, he's there, he's running a democracy, but is very pointed in saying it's not a liberal democracy because he doesn't like homosexuality, he doesn't like the idea of women having too many rights and so on. And, uh, and one of the things that he is very clear about is that he wants to have a judiciary that is captured and is tame uh, to his ends, that will deal with his opponents. He wants to be able to uh, uh, clamp down on, um, on immigration in a, very, uh, in a very authoritarian manner. And he also wants to uh, make sure that um, the press is owned by his friends in order to make sure that, I mean, I'm giving that example of Hungary because I think it's quite an interesting one of where we've seen the, the, the whole business of using a period of the pandemic where he went after the media and legislated against journalists writing stuff that he didn't like during that period and it had no sunset clause on it. So I think that the, the coming together of the two pandemics was particularly poisonous for liberal democracy and liberal democracy should be our aspiration. Before we move to the audience, the same question to you, Dipudama. Uh, I mean, it's hard to add to anything that Helena has said because uh, one, of course, she put it so eloquently, but second, that uh, I agree with every word that she said. Uh, and um, I do think that COVID created a situation where uh, it became possible to, I guess, play, uh, you know, fast and loose with uh, uh, with what we take to be the rule of law uh, and what we take to be liberal democracy. Uh, I do think that somewhere like Britain, there's been uh, there was a, a tremendous pushback against it as well. You saw it um, both within and outside Parliament, uh, and I, I often didn't agree, for example, with the uh, you know with the crowds that used to gather every Saturday on Trafalgar Square. But I, uh, uh, um, of you know, anti-vaxxers and uh, a quite uh, eclectic sort of mix, should I put it, of people. But I did somewhere get the sentiment that uh, the that you know we th that they were not uh, agreeable to living in a proto-authoritarian society, and I think there was something admirable in a sense about it, uh, and um, that is something that we did not see in India where uh, despite, uh, in a sense, having this quite brutal national lockdown, um, there was no electoral price that, uh, that for example, um, the BJP has paid. If anything, uh, they've won handsomely in, in most of the elections after that. So um, does that tell you something about society? Well, maybe, maybe not. But I do think that it normalized, in a sense, this, uh, this, this way of being. Uh, uh, and I think there is there is a kind of danger for this sort of 
uh, of the use of, uh, of sort of biological emergencies um, in the future. Right. Uh, on that note, I think we should now move to the audience. Um, if you do have any questions, please raise your hands. Uh, Mr. Tharoor. Yeah. Is there a, do we have a mic somewhere? We do. It's just coming your way. Thanks. That was a fabulously interesting discussion. Thanks to all three of you. A um, couple of questions, I mean, a couple of comments with questions embedded in them. On the issue of executive overreach, the one area none of you touched upon was the federalism that is supposed to be core to our constitution. So, for example, when you mentioned executive overreach on the declaration of a lockdown, it was not just that parliament wasn't consulted and indeed the cabinet wasn't consulted, but that the states were not consulted and they're the ones who had to implement the lockdown because law and order is a state subject. With the result that in fact it was a, strictly speaking, a violation of the constitution that no one pointed out at the time. I, I'd like to know your thoughts on that. I suppose three of them are more than Helena, but Helena uh, doesn't have that particular issue here. It's one that in the Indian context is worrying uh, because you do have a situation where when you talk about breaks or checks on executive overreach, the existence of state governments that are not necessarily run by the same party as runs the central government is the one check we've got in our democracy against uh, uh, a fiat kind of system. The, the second uh, uh, comment and question is, of course, that none, none of you also talked about parliamentary procedure. I think the anti-defection law is right. I think the two MPs sitting here from India both share your concern very much. Uh, 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 your excoriation of that law, which was passed, Helena, with very good intentions. There was a, an epidemic of people hopping from one party to the next in order to create a legislative majority and usually motivated by pelf, uh, by money, by lucre. Uh, and therefore, the law was passed in order to prevent that from happening. But now it's become an instrument of, uh, of, of, of party autocracies where essentially every bill, without exception, involves a whip and there is no freedom of conscience anymore for MPs. But what about other procedures? For example, uh, the fact that, um, that no private member's bill ever gets seriously discussed or passed. The fact that the opposition is unable to have any time during a parliamentary week to place its issues on the agenda. The government not only decides on the bills they introduce, they also decide on what legislative business will be, will be discussed. With the result that, as you know, we have a record number of disruptions from frustrated opposition parties saying, well, if we can't discuss this issue, we'll paralyze the House until we can shout slogans uh, raising these issues. Now, I, was, I remember speaking to, to Speaker John Burka when he led a parliamentary delegation to India a few years ago, and he said that the last parliamentary dis uh, disruption in England was 1661 or whenever it was that Cromwell came by and marched into the House and disrupted it. We have one every day, almost, certainly every week. So these are issues, again, can parliamentary procedures be improved by learning from the Westminster model? Would you like to start, Tripadam? Um, yes, sure. I mean, I agree entirely with, uh, with what Dr. Tharoor says. And uh, I think parliamentary pro he, he has pointed out to parliamentary procedure, which is a key uh, part of, um, or, uh, if, if you, it's a key part of like the concept of Eastminster as Harshenden kind of developed it, but also a key part of the article that I, that I wrote. Uh, and in that, he's, uh, he's entirely right, that the executive is placed uh, in charge of legislative business, which, is, uh, which obviously gives it um, uh, a huge inordinate amount of power. Uh, and on federalism, of course, I mean, um, the Indian constitution is, isn't really all that federal either, given that it, uh, that it, it you know, again, gives, uh, it, it, it's highly centralized and at the end of the day, it gives the union the power to uh, both make a state and to uh, dismember, a, uh, dismember a state if it so wants, uh, and without any reference to the wishes of uh, who, the people who are living there. Uh, and so um, uh, I would disagree with the idea that, that state governments are in, 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 in effect a particularly uh, important check on, on, sort of, uh, on, on, on executive power. But I do agree that dispersal of political authority is in and of itself um, a, a, a kind of a, a very productive check on, on all powerful executives. And I think um, uh, uh, perhaps uh, whenever he's back in power, a sort of solidification of Indian federalism uh, in the constitution would be, would be in order. And uh, along with that, also solidification of dispersal of power within parliament and within parties, 
because uh, given how the Indian political system is structured, the, uh, and if, uh, you know, if we look back at history, the only uh, times when Indian democracy is seen to have, uh, I guess, uh, function in a way that would be recognizable as, uh, as democratic uh, uh, or democratic uh, in the kind of normative way that we see in the West uh, would be when no single party is able to muster uh, a large majority. And I think, uh, so perhaps whenever he's next in power, uh, solidification of some of these ideas into, you know, into, into the constitutional structure would be, uh, would be a great thing to see. The only thing I would say is that, um, you know, I was pointing out that governments never want to engage with uh, seriously creating a new constitution. And so, uh, and to, for us to get any, any, any change or any, any written constitution in Britain would be impossible. Constitutions tend to be created at points of great change. Your country in, its, in, its, uh, in the great sort of moment of 47 to 48, that moment of change. And, uh, and you know, it, it usually is after a revolution or after a war, or, uh, you know, the, the Germany got its new constitution after the Second World War, Japan too. And so the, it tends to be that constitutions come out of great disruptions of some kind. And so you don't get any government also very willing to give power away once they're elected. So, you know, there was the, there was the um, uh, uh, Blair government. Um, the, the, in the manifesto, they'd made their commitments to the sort of Charter 88 agenda, but as soon as they were in power, you know, the idea of having proportional representation was jettisoned. Um, the idea of having a written constitution was jettisoned. They did incorporate the European Convention on Human Rights into English law and Scots law and Northern Irish law in, in different legislation. But, um, um, but, uh, but then they were sort of almost ran away from it. They didn't protect it well enough and didn't let the public feel that this belonged to them. And so it's been a hard old thing, protecting the Human Rights Act. And now we've got a government that's come in that wants to bring in a British Bill of Rights. And the British Bill of Rights they want to bring in is about less rights, not more rights. So, you know, always be wary when people are, are making a gift of rights. They don't usually, um, uh, uh, you know, they have to usually have their arm twisted. And, uh, and that, was, that was one of the reasons why I ended up in the House of Lords was that I was to help you know, put through some of those constitutional changes like the Human Rights Act, and now it's under threat, which I think is a great, a great, uh, uh, re regrettable thing for, to be happening, and we have to all campaign and get on the streets because it has protected minority communities, it's protected the rights of women, and it has been absolutely powerful in, uh, in uh, protecting the rights of, um, of, of all of us as citizens. So, um, uh, we've got to be on the streets for that one. Should we go back to the audience for some more questions? Uh, just there. Okay. Uh, thank you for a very informative session. So I think uh, one thing we can all agree on that between Eastminster and Westminster, one thing is definitely for common. That is, yes, minister. Right. So I would like to know, like, w what, according to you, is the major contrast in civil services or bureaucracy in the way both the governments function, and especially to what extent is bureaucracy an en enabler and an impediment to decision making? Thank you. Okay, Tripur Daman. Um, so bureaucracy is not something that I'm the most familiar with, or something that I really write about or work on, but. Uh, Again, I would say, uh, purely from observation, that uh, a bureaucracy in Britain seem to have, uh, I guess, a lot more freedom of conscience uh, and a lot less, how, I, how should I put it, uh, sense of cravenness towards, the, towards political authority than, uh, than India. And of course, it also helps that Britain has a sort of far longer tradition of, uh, of, of, uh, of sort of bureaucratic work. I mean. Uh, uh, of uh, file notings and the, the need for ministerial directions and uh, when ministerial directions are needed and not needed. Uh, and I think uh, uh, also a much stronger Freedom of Information Act uh, my, and things like that, which I, I guess, uh, you know, from my point of view, uh, make it a society that is a lot more open, a government that is a lot more open than, uh, than one which we experience 
um, in India? I mean, one of the great things um, of, of the, I mean, a great institution in the British political system um, was the independent civil service. And, um, and while we all laughed at, at yes, min minister, um, about the power that was wielded by, minister, by, by permanent secretaries and the senior civil service. Um, uh, and no doubt that was true, but the, the, the purpose of the senior civil service servant's role as someone experienced who's come up through the system is to basically deliver the policies of the government of the day, but also to advise the, the government of the day when some of the policies that they want to deliver are unworkable, they're not deliverable. So you have to be prepared to speak truth to power. The, 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 so the idea of the senior civil servant is that someone with, the, with the experience would be able to say to the prime minister, if it was the, uh, the cabinet secretary, or if you're the, the, the senior person, the permanent secretary at the foreign office, say, I, I'm not sure that that would be a wise thing to do. Um, and of course, there are all these other people who are the legal advisors and so on, who are trying to give legal advice about what is not a good thing to do. And unfortunately, uh, there has been a growing thing in Britain, and it's not confined to one party. This has been happening over, the, the, over uh, decades now. Has been uh, um, the rise of the special political advisor, the SPAD. And the special political advisor is basically to replace that role of the, the, the yes minister um, uh, uh, civil servant. And so the SPAD is there, and so that you will say, um, um, you know, this is what we want to do and we're going to do it come hell or high water. And the, and the permanent secretary will say, well, actually, hold on a minute. And, and would often be listened to. The permanent secretaries are now being uh, pushed to the edges and their power is being reduced to a minimum. And I think that is a great pity, you know, of not taking advice. Um, and, and, we, and, it, and it results in, I think, bad government. If you don't listen to the people who've been have gathered experience over many decades um, and are now a senior level, if you don't listen to their advice, then, then you're likely to get into trouble. And unfortunately, arrogant government means that there's less um, respect for the advice that's coming from our senior civil servants, who, let me tell you, work very hard at that business about being impartial. But, um, but you know, we, we did lots of things. I mean, I was against the Iraq war. The advice that was being given from the, the, the senior lawyer, one of the senior lawyers there, Elizabeth Wilmshurst, resigned because the, the lawyers inside the, the Foreign Office were saying, this is going to be contrary to international law. You haven't got a, a UN resolution. And, uh, and uh, then they went to the ex uh, you know, international lawyers externally, and they had to go cherry picking to find the one that would give the advice that would enable uh, the, the, the war to take place. And once you start doing that, you really are uh, entering the, the business of, of poor, government, poor governance. And so um, I regret the, the diminution of our um, civil service. I think it is being damaged. And I think that it was one of the, the, the sort of things that enriched our democracy, having that independence. Look at the business in the United States. They, they appoint that, you know, all the, the, their ambassadors and everybody are renewed every time there's a new president. And so then, you know, I mean, in fact, Trump didn't, uh, didn't appoint most of his ambassadors around the world. I'm, I don't know if India was lucky enough to get one, but, you know, lots of places, countries didn't get one um, because it wasn't considered important to him to have ambassadors because he'd given up on the international. He didn't believe in internationalism. It was put America first that was, was his priority. So uh, appointing ambassadors wasn't important. We have professional ambassadors. You have professional ambassadors, by and large, and I think that is a good thing. And, uh, and people need to be advised about uh, why um, doing certain things might be dangerous in terms of world peace. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of an independent uh, civil servant service, and I think ours is currently being eroded. Yeah, just uh, just a quick point. I mean, I'd agree with everything uh, with everything Helena said. The only point that I uh, did make is not just that India's civil, uh, the sort of tradition of independence in India's civil uh, service is completely eroded, but India also has a particularly opaque uh, government structure, not really amenable uh, to to easy access, which makes it, uh, uh, I guess, doubly uh, dangerous. In fact. 
we may have time for one last uh, question. Just the lady right here in the, in the center. Is there a mic? Yes, I'll just be with you shortly. Um, I think mine is more a comment, but curious to hear who's given who's on the stage right now. I think one thing that's really interesting about British politics um, in general is, is sort of this collective amnesia about like the imperial legacy of the UK and how that's impacted um, legislation around the world. I grew up in Malaysia and um, it's 62 years of independence and we still retain legislation, which India does as well, I, I believe. Um, that has already been repealed here. For example, the Sedition Act, Printing and Publishers Act, Sodomy Laws, and so on. And I'm just wondering how often does that feature in, in these conversations um, about when you're amending legislation constitutions, whether clearly the UK has repealed certain laws because it no longer works. Um, does that feature in the, the Indian discourse and also in the UK, is that ever also brought up? This is a consequence of what we did it continues to impact human rights around the world, and it continues to impact democracies around the world because of something we introduced you know, years ago. Um, but really curious to, of how that kind of features into these conversations. Thanks. Good example of this Tripur Daman is of course the Indian Penal Code, which continues to retain what's described as the marital rape exception, i.e. a husband can never be prosecuted for raping his own wife, uh, which dates back to 1860 and of course, which is a uh, colonial legacy. Yeah, would you like to address that first? Uh, yeah, sure. And um, you're, you're completely right. And it's not that they don't feature in conversations, but again, as Elena said, uh, governments find it useful to have uh, these quite nebulous uh, laws on the books because at some point or the other, they're always useful to trap critics uh, or to jam opponents with uh, or to, um, uh, uh, you know, wield discretionary power. And in a sense, uh, India is peculiarly vulnerable to, to forms of discretionary power. Uh, I always like to say that it's a country of petty sovereigns. And uh, when the constitution was being made, the uh, communist uh, leader, Somnath Lahiri, called it a constitution made from the point of view of a police constable. And ultimately, it is, uh, it's that level of power uh, that's responsible for, uh, uh, you know, for for, for working the Indian state. And they really uh, are fond of discretionary power as, uh, you know, as all sort of petty sovereigns are. And until you can create enough social consensus to, uh, to really push back against it uh, or to uh, make sure that the politicians decide that we no longer want these laws in the books, I'm, I tend to think that uh, they quite like having them there. Any final comments from you, Helena? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, there's undoubtedly the legacy that um, of Britain as a colonial power has left around the world um, in, some in some places has been so detrimental in some arenas. Um, I mean, for example, just now, we, um, we do a lot of work on the whole business of uh, raising, uh, of trying to end the criminalization of homosexuality. Because we've, we've done research which has shown that where you have criminal law that, criminal, that, that makes someone a cr criminal by virtue of their sexuality, um, it leads to terrible persecution of those, um, of those, of those minorities. It means that, uh, um, that there's a much higher levels of murder, of discrimination, of assault, of abuses of one kind or another. And we did a piece of a big piece of work, particularly around the Caribbean, where, where that was clear, and it was shocking. And so um, I feel very strong, and I speak about it regularly. Is that we we were responsible for that around the world, introducing the idea that it was criminal, and uh, and that that is all a British legacy, and and we should be therefore advocating um, everywhere we go that this has to be stopped, that it was a folly, and we and and uh, and leads to actually torture and persecution in so many places. The business on women, of course. I mean, I mean, in 1992, I mean, I know it's 30 years ago, um, but we, I was very involved in the whole business of advocating that they, they ha we had to end this business that um, a, a, a husband can rape his wife. 
Um, and we know that it sits inside the context of domestic violence, of uh, male primacy and, and male entitlement. And we're not going to create a just and fair world for men and women, but, but particularly for women, uh, um, if we don't actually end those kinds of, of laws. And so I think Britain has a responsibility to call it out where they see it and to say we're responsible, uh, we've learned our lesson, please can we pass on our, our wisdom now to others. Okay. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Thank you very much.